Okay, my name is Candy Schwartz, and I'm local. I teach in the Faculty of Library and Information Science at Simmons College, which is about a half hour to three quarter of an hour walk that way. And I am not really associated with the law field in any way except as a normal consumer, which in which case I normally, as most of us would, try to avoid it as much as possible. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is talk about general search engines, which is something I am very much interested in, have been following for a number of years, web and pre-web. Um, I teach in the areas of a whole wide range of things, but mostly to do with organizations. So I teach cataloging and classification, indexing, web design, information architecture, database management, those kinds of things. And um, I've always been very interested in information retrieval through my master's degree in library science and my doctorate at Syracuse University. Um, I also have had the opportunity, since they are in Boston, to go to the search engine conferences that happen here every April, and so this is kind of a fun opportunity, I think, to pull together a lot of things that I've observed at those conferences over the last four years. So we're just going to walk through um, what essentially amounts to what, what are things like now, where are they going currently, and then at the very end we'll do a little bit of where might they really go in the far future, whatever far is these days on the internet. And if we have time, I'll show you some resources that I think are useful to help you stay uh, up to date with what's going on in search engine land. I love this room. I have, <laughs> I have envy for this room. All right, so where we are now is an overabundance of search engines. This is basically pick a search engine, any search engine. These two things happen to be directories. We'll come back to the idea about, of directories in a minute. But just to notice that Fossic.com says over 3,000 specialist search engines, and Alba36.com says over 50,000 specialty search engines. So there's a lot of search engines out there of one kind or another. And of course, in this case, in some, uh, in some way, they're being defined rather loosely. But there are a lot of search engines. Within a year of the World Wide Web becoming the World Wide Web, before it was the graphical World Wide Web, there were some. And within a year or two after the graphical World Wide Web, there were many, and now there are thousands. Just a quick review of the current types. The ones we're mostly familiar with, of course, the query type, where the intention is that you type something into the query box and you get back your, here are your first 10 of 30,000 relevant items. <laughs> Although Google is better than most. Searching, it says 1,346,966,000 web pages. Actually searching more like about 700 million web pages and able to deliver you information from 1,346,000,000 1, and so on and so forth. We'll come back to that issue in a little bit. Um, Although it's true that Google does actually, Google has a web directory, and although it's true that directory types have places where you can search either the directories or search the, um, the web using other search engines, it's pretty clear that Google and AltaVista, Lycos, and so on are intended to primarily be enter your query, do your search. Then we have the Yahoo Look Smart. Uh, Netscape Open Directory, originally the Open Directory, which it still is kind, where the intention is that you should browse through things and find, but of course they all provide a search box for you to find the right category, and if you can't find the right category, they all provide some kind of access to searching, whether it be their own, which is unusual, or some pass through to some other query-based engine. So we're all familiar with that kind. Then we have the directories. You saw two of them a couple of screens ago, Alpha 36 and Fossic. This is all searchengines.com, which is a gross exaggeration, but you get the idea. And there are lots of these out there. Here I have pages full of these on, I have a page full of these, screens full of these on the web that I'll show you a little bit later. But there are tons of directories. They're very useful when you're looking around for specialized search engines. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, legal specialized search engines, but if you were trying to look for specialized search engines in, say, architecture, then these would be good places to start. And we'll come back to this idea of specialized search engines a little bit later. Then we have the meta search engines, of which Dogpile is probably one of the best known. Um, meta search engines, of course, search a number of other search engines on your behalf, um, which is fine, and sometimes it is fine, and sometimes it's not so fine, and they all do it in slightly different ways. Um, and they sometimes do it from slightly different places as well, as we'll see shortly. But those are the four basic kinds. Now, you may say, what happened to Ask Jeeves in here? Um, <laughs> Well, I guess if I had to classify Ask Jeeves within these four, I, I, I resist making a category, I'm sorry, for Ask Jeeves. 
And if I had to put it in here somewhere, I would probably put it in with the Yahoo Look Smart Like, a directory kind, because what it really is is a, a millions of prepackaged answers to questions. So it's more like a browsable directory in a way than, than it is like a dog pile or like an Alta Vista or a Google. So we don't have a category for ASCIIs, but yes, I am aware that it exists. And no, I don't like it very much, but that's just me. But it never gives me good answers for anything I'm asking. Another interesting thing about the state of the art of search engines is where the searching is actually done or where the results come. The searching can be done in most cases uh, for things like Google and so on, done on the web. That is, when you go to do a search, what you do is you um, open up Google and the searching is done at Google and the results are delivered to you. However, as you probably know, there are all sorts of handy dandy little agents that you can download and put on your desktop that will do meta searching for you. So instead of going off to Dogpile, you can run Lexbot or Bullseye or Copernic or any one of these kinds of things and have the meta searching done from your desktop, which is a little bit easier on the rest of the world. <laughs> bit easier on the rest of the world servers, but of course puts a little more effort on your desktop. But that doesn't, that's perfectly fine from the search engine point of view. Um, and there are a lot of other advantages to those kinds of desktop utilities as well, one of them being the ability to organize materials if you're going to deliver them to clients. Bullseye is, has quite a good reputation for helping you package what you find and organize what you find and make it more palatable to the people to whom you're going to deliver it. So that's one issue, is where is the searching actually being done? And then the other interesting thing is where are the results actually coming? For most of us, I would assume, they're coming to things that I would call either desktops or laptops, things with decent screens that we would think of as microcomputers. But it's certainly beginning to be the case that you can have this delivered to your cell phone, your mobile PDA. I have a Windows CE machine, which is not that different in, in screen size, really, from a very small laptop. But if you have a, a web-enabled phone, of course, you can have some of this stuff on your web-enabled phone. Not a lot of it yet, and you wouldn't want to look at a lot of it that way, but that's not an area we can ignore. I think this, I like this one. I hunted around for a picture of the Ericsson phone because I think it's just neat. It's just a neat design. If it's closed, if that part, she points at the screen. If, <laughs> this is where this thing is going to be interesting. If this part is up, then it looks just like a cell phone. But if you open this part, you have a little web screen. I think that's very cool. So I don't think that kind of stuff's going to go away. I don't think it's going to happen as fast as people who are into the cell phone industry would like it to happen, but I certainly um, don't see this going away. And if you're going to do searching, searching can be delivered to your whatever you want to call this device, um, just the same way it can be delivered to your desktop. How does it all work? You're probably all familiar with this as well, but we'll just review it briefly. And I'll say a few things about various aspects of this as we do. Here's your user sitting somewhere searching Google. Here's uh, Google delivering information from Sony.com. How does Google get that information? And the answer is Google and all of the others send out um, discovery agents that run around the web gathering up information about what's out there that should be in the Google database. Um, you can also, of course, submit sites. It could take a long time or never to get your submitted site into the search engine, but most search engines allow for some submission process. Most of the information that goes into a search engine database comes through the discovery agent process. So the, UR, the information comes back. The discovery agents gather information that's going to form the representation. They bring it back. They cache it somewhere um, on the search engine site. And then representation agents take care of gathering up the information that's going to represent that page, site, whatever, in the database. And uh, there'll be a lot of differences in how those representations are formed, and we'll look at those in a second. In between the representation agents gathering up that which is going to form the searchable database and the actual putting of that information into the database, there might be some form of representation enhancement. Usually there isn't, because enhancement is often done intellectually, and intellectual anything costs time and money. An example of an intellectual enhancement might be somebody who works at the company looking at a particular site that's come in through a discovery agent and saying, aha, that's really important. It should go in this channel, this part of our directory. And if it goes in this channel or this part of our directory, then it's enhanced in that there'll be some information added to it that says it's part of this directory or it's part of this channel. But that takes time. That takes labor. Another form of representation might be done um, automatically. Um, Northern Light has a combination of sort of manually constructed 
slash automatically constructed classification categories and um, there's been 20 or 30 years worth of research into doing automatic classification based on text content. So if you're given a, a structure, a taxonomic structure, and some intelligence from the past about what kinds of things went into particular categories, you can read a new thing and say, okay, given the text content of this item, it should probably be assigned to this category. So there would be an example of where you could do some automatic enhancement. Um, Excite does some enhancement. It's not exactly at the representation level, but they do their what they call ICE, intelligent concept extraction, where there's some form of, and I, I don't know how it works, but there's some form of matching dictionary um, which will say, well, if the page contains terms like elderly, then we'll also make it available for people who search with words like old age or senior citizen. So there's some kind of of a little bit of an intelligence and enhancement at that level. I don't believe that's done at, at the point of handling the representation. It's more done at the point of the retrieval process. And then it goes into the database and that's what you search when you use Google and then Google delivers you the actual results or whoever it is you're using delivers you the actual results once you've looked through your little list of the first 10 of 3,000 or 30,000 or 40,000 things. <laughs> Um, just as an example of how active these things are, AltaVista claims that its little uh, agent visits or its collection of little agents visits millions of pages daily, is what it says. And many of them visit millions of pages daily. There used to be, on a site called Search Engine Watch, which is a great site and still there, there used to be in, in the unsubscribed members or the unmembers part a little Search Engine EKG where Danny Sullivan, who runs Search Engine Watch, um, did a study of how frequently the discovery agents visited, visited a selection of sites. And so there were these little charts that would show how frequently did the Alta Vista discovery agent come to the site, come back to the site, come back to the site. It's really interesting, but I haven't seen it, and I've been hunting for it, and I believe it's buried under the parts that you have to be a member of to see, which is too bad. And at some point I might just join to get that back, because that's neat stuff. Um, this is a little bit about what the agents discover, what kinds of things dictate whether an agent's going to visit a site, how frequently an agent's going to visit a site or revisit a site, and so on. So these are some of the things that are built into those algorithms. Uh, popularity. A, a site that is pointed to by lots of other sites will be visited by discovery agents and will be visited more frequently by discovery agents for refreshment. So that's, that's a pretty obvious one. Volatility. A site that's noted for changing a lot will probably be visited more frequently because it will need more frequent refreshing. And an, another interesting one is isolation. A site that isn't pointed to by many other sites, that isn't referenced very often, in, for some search engines will be a site that is deliberately visited by discovery agents. And that's, I think that's an interesting, um, an interesting aspect of, of building up your database. What do you want to have? What you want to have is the things that nobody else has. Why do, why do retros I presume most of you speak sufficient library ease to know <laughs> what I'm going to say. Why do retrospective conversion companies fund the conversion of the, the catalogs of large research libraries, or why did they? Because the catalogs of large research libraries contain things that are unique to those large research libraries and will enhance the database that's available to the retrospective conversion agency. Why is OCLC happy when uh, uh, a Harvard library retrospectively converts and puts all its information to OCLC. And I'm not saying that happened, but, but as an example. And the answer is it makes the database bigger and it gives OCLC the, a whole bunch of extra stuff that none of the other services have. So a search engine could look at that the same way and say, if we have things that none of the other search engines have or that few of the other search engines have, then that's to our advantage. So an isolated site would be a good point for that. And then, of course, there's the, well, we purchased XYZ company, so we're going to be sure to have everything that's in their site indexed, or there's the, uh, this company is paying us to make sure that everything in our site is indexed. So partner content or paid content sites tend to be visited more frequently um, and refreshed more often. Another interesting thing about the, the agent discovery process is how deep down they go. Top pages only, so many levels down. There can be some problems with the discovery agents um, thinking that the URL pattern is the way you determine what a top page is, and that's generally true. The shorter the URL, the more likely it is that's the top page of a site or a subsite. That's not always true. And so if an agent is basing some of its assessment of, so what are the top pages on the length of the URL or the number of, let's say, slashes in the URL, that's not always going to be the best indicator of what the important pages are. 
But that's the kind of thing that agents do, and they all do it differently. And you can't find out exactly who is doing what because it's all proprietary, of course. Um, okay. Discovery issues, things that you want to know about a search engine if you're going to make it your best friend and reliable agent are how frequently things are discovered, how frequently information is re-examined. It's pretty easy to tell once you start clicking through results and getting a lot of dead links that they're not looking at a very highly refreshed, they're not looking at that site very often in any event. And then there's the interesting issue of time lag between the acquisition of the fact that this site exists to the, yeah, we finally got around to indexing it and putting it into the database. And that can actually be sometimes quite long. Certainly in the manual submission process where you let a search engine know that you want your site indexed, it can be a while until you see it. But even in the discovery agent process, when the discovery agent recognizes that uh, thus and such a site exists, there might be a time lag between that recognition and the entry of that information into the searchable indexed database at the search engine level. Other things to think about are what are the limitations of discovery agents. They tend to go principally for the English language. They tend to go principally for North America, at least North American agents. And they tend to go principally for the dot-com sites. And we'll come back to that when we look at the invisible web a little bit. What are the agents looking at? Well, they're looking at the underlying HTML code in most cases, although lately they've added other stuff. But primarily, they're looking at the underlying HTML. So they actually get that structure. Some of them take advantage of that structure. As we'll see in, in many search engines, although not many people avail themselves of it, you can do fielded search, search for this in title. It usually isn't much more than search for this in title, search for this in link. Um, but it would be nice if you could search for this in headings. Of course, that assumes that people have been doing good HTML coding, which is not a safe assumption, unless you've taken classes with me, in which case it's probably a reasonably safe assumption. <laughs> At least if while you were doing it for me, you were doing it well. Um, they also, of course, could pay attention to meta tags. Some of them do, some of them deliberately don't. A lot of search engines choose deliberately to ignore meta tags, partly because of a lot of abuse of meta tags early on in the um, HTML creation game, or early on in the game where companies wanted to be sure they ranked highly, so they put spam into meta tags, which is unfortunate. But I, put, I do meta coding, meta tagging on all of my pages, and so if a search engine paid attention, they would be able to get some information out of this that relates to the content of the page, and it includes words which might not be repeated on the page. But certainly a search engine can take advantage of that if the representation agent has been programmed to do so. So here we have um, just a title, some meta tags, a heading level one, having level two. We've got some URLs. Um, search agents or the representation agents might even index the, the actual whole URL. We don't have any pictures on here. I, no, we don't, I didn't put any of my images on here, but um, you've got alt text for image tags. That's sometimes indexed. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of things that are indexed. Um, these days, search engines are becoming much better about penalizing spam. And spam, I just mentioned, of course, is the obvious kind where if you want to sell cat food, you go meta name equal keyword content equal cat food, cat food, cat food, cat food a thousand times. And since most search engine ranking is based on counting number of times word occurs, you get bumped right up when somebody does a search for cat food. Well, search engines realized that was happening pretty early on and started penalizing against unusually high occurrences of words in documents, um, certainly words in meta. The best, one of the best examples of spam I ever saw was a page which came up when I did a search for information retrieval, and the page came up and it was just an image. It was a, a GIF image, and it had no text on the page that you could see. And the image didn't actually say anything about information retrieval. And if you looked at the code underneath, what you could see on the screen, all the way down to the bottom of where the image was, said nothing about information retrieval. There was no alt text for the image, but hello. But there was a very long scroll bar. And if you scrolled all the way down, way to the bottom, at the very bottom of this like sixth or seventh screen of empty stuff, there was a whole bunch of white font, white coded font on a white background, which said information retrieval over and over and over and over and over again. And I thought that was pretty inventive. It took us a while. It was in class it happened. It took us a while to figure out what was going on. But that kind of thing search engines pay attention to, and that kind of thing they learn to cope with pretty quickly because it makes your consumers rather unhappy. And search engines don't really want unhappy consumers. 
what are the agents index? So what do those representation agents grab when they create that representation that you are searching in the database? And the answer is a number of different things depending on the search engine. All words, sometimes. Some, some search engines pride themselves on in indexing every single word, including the URL as a word, including comment text, perhaps, in the underlying HTML document, including alt text and image tags describing what the image is, including meta tags, sometimes including stop words, sometimes excluding stop words. If stop words are mentioned, it's really nice if you can see a list of them. Stop words aren't always the things you might think they would be. They're not always a uh, and an and the and of. Sometimes they're actually substantive words that are just too frequent and the database won't search them, the search engine won't search them. And I came across one that would not search the word internet. And it's very hard to search the word HTML because it's part of so much. Um, and then excluding spam, of course. Sometimes uh, discovery agents or representation agents will only index and make searchable the first X many words however many that is, 30, 40. Sometimes it's only the X many lines, lines being lines in the HTML document. Uh, sometimes it's only the most frequent words. So a raw count will be done and then the top most frequent words will form the representation. Sometimes it's only words in certain fields, but that's pretty rare. Uh, sometimes it includes words in pages that are linked subordinately to the page that's being indexed. So it's really the site that's being indexed, it's not the page. It's rather disconcerting when you go to a page and you don't see the word that you used in your search. But sometimes it's because secondary pages have that page, have that word. So there are lots of different things that a search and a discovery agent or an indexing agent might index. I put web search up here because web search is a site that um, is one of many that's sort of an about search engines type of site, but it does a particularly nice job of looking at what the different indexing rules are for about eight top search engines. And if we have time, I'll show you web search because I think it's neat. But I just wanted to mention it here because if I said web search does a good job, you'd all think S-E-A-R-C-H. Because there already was a web search, this web search is S-E-R-C-H. So I thought it would be worth putting it up there so you could see it visually. Okay, so what's our current state of searching? What, what do we have at our fingertips? We have tons of wonderful searching capabilities in many cases at most search engines. We're all familiar with put it in quote marks. We usually have, I want this but not that, so jazz but not I omega, I don't want the drive, I want jazz the music. Dewey classification, not the political figure. Uh, in some search engines, adjacency, I want folk within X many words of the word music, although you'd have to think about and if you have this possibility in a search engine and all they say is you can do near, then you want to know what that means. Does that mean within one word of, within two words of, within three words of? Does the order matter? This will be interpreted differently from, of course, engine to engine. And a lot of them allow you to do full Boolean statements with nested parentheses and the whole shebang. So there are a lot of tools out there that you can use. You can do fielded searching. I want this in the title. Um, I want this in the link. I want even this in the alt text. I want this in the applet field for those things which have Java. Some search engines are case sensitive or can be asked to be case sensitive. So in, I think it's Alta Vista, if you type in a mix of upper and lower, then the search will be case sensitive. If you type all in lower, the search will not be case sensitive. Well, that's pretty intelligent. And that can be a handy feature, especially for a search of that kind. Most of them, or many of them, have some form of truncation or masking. It's almost always terminal truncation, which is easy to do. So classific whatever. Sometimes it's internal truncation or internal masking, so organize Z-ation or organize S-ation. Uh, there's one case, and I forget which, I was just reading this yesterday, where you can actually use the masking character for a whole word. So you could say, if I wanted to search for library science, which is often referred to as library science or library and information science, I could say, quote, library asterisk science, and that would pick up library science as well as library and information science, maybe. Um, very rarely do you have initial masking. That's pretty rare. Um, it's very hard to do. It's very computing intensive. Uh, the only system I'm familiar with it f for is probably one you know a lot better than I do, which is I think the trademark scan, if it's still called that, used to do initial mask, initial, initial truncation. Um, but that's pretty rare. Very few search engines recognize irregular plurals like goose and geese. Many allow you to restrict to particular domains or to particular countries, which is really using domain names but doing it slightly different, wording it a different way. Quite a few allow you to restrict by date of publication, 
on server, that's not a great idea because the presence of the data is uh, based on whether the server provides the data or not, and um, it's not a terribly reliable thing to do, but it's available in a lot of search engines, and many let you restrict to language, either only English or only French or only German or only this, that, or the other. So we have tons of tools at our fingertips, although it is interesting to note how many search engines got rid of their advanced search screens or anything really interesting in advanced searching over the last four or five years. And if you ask them why, they usually say, because a teensy-weensy point of a percentage of people ever used this and it wasn't worth maintaining it. There were some wonderful tools at, I think it was actually Alta Vista back in the early days where you could go into an advanced search screen and then you could go further into that into a JavaScript enhanced search screen and it would give you all sorts of word associations and really neat things and they just dropped it completely. And there are lots of things like that that are interesting search tools that have just been dropped completely because nobody used them and they didn't want to bother supporting them, which I think is a great shame. Certainly pedagogically it's a great shame. And of course I do what everybody else does, which is I don't use any of that. I just go to a search engine and go blah, 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 find it. Now that's not entirely true. I do use fancy searching if I'm really after something complex. Um, but if I'm just cruising around looking for stuff quickly, I do what we all do, which is type a few words into the query bar and hit go. And I rarely even bother changing the, all of the words, any of the words, this, that, or the other. I'll just take my chances. I'll look down the first ten. I'll maybe go to the second screen. Um, probably not. So I'm as bad as anybody else. But that's the kind of thing we do. Um, that makes life a little difficult for the search engines. We, we berate them for not giving us well-ranked results, and we don't give them much information to rank those results on. Um, we'll come back to that issue a little bit later. But let's look at this French folk music for a minute. As a professional searcher, which I used to be, I don't I actually used to teach online searching. Um, I don't anymore, but certainly at the time when I did teach online searching, the thing I would beat into the heads of my students was, if you're going to go into any environment where you can search and you're going to type more than one word, it behooves you to understand exactly what that is doing. What does that mean to the search engine that is running your search? And so if I were doing this and thinking about it, this is what I'd want to know. If I'm typing French folk music, Am I being restricted to a particular field? Or is it going to bother looking at any particular field? Am I going to be able to retrieve that if it's in the title? Am I going to be able to retrieve that if it's in the first level, level heading? Am I going to be able to retrieve that if it's in meta? Is it actually going to look for French folk music as a phrase altogether? Is it really going to look for French near the word folk, near the word music? Is it really just going to be doing a great big and? Is it really going to be doing looking for any of those words, which is going to be horrible? Is it also going to pick up related words like Breton or music in French? And is it going to automatically truncate any of those things? Some do, some don't. Well, I think we assume, at least I assume, automatic truncation in most cases, and that's not always true. So is it going to pick up musics, which doesn't exist, musicians, musical, and so on? Is it going to pick up any of those things? And for each search engine that you ask these questions of, you'll get a different story. There's a point where it doesn't matter in in a sense, if you look at how search engines rank, most ranking is based on a variety of statistical algorithms which will, no matter what the search is translated into, if you think about it in a Boolean way, will eventually end up being, well, we're going to prefer the things that have these three words in this order next to each other, and the next most important are going to be the ones where they're close, and the next most important are going to be the ones where they're all present, and the next most important are going to be ones that contain any of those words. So the ranking algorithm will do some of it, but not all of it. And I think it's still wise to know what it is you're asking when you ask something in more than one word. These are some of the things that go into ranking. This is based, again, on work that's been done for, geez, since 1950s on using computers to handle text. And very little of it is beyond that. Very little of what you see in general search engines is anything more than counting and dividing. Um, there's nothing, there's very little in the way of fancy semantic processing. In fact, there's nothing in the way of fancy semantic processing. We'll look a little bit at that. But it's all based on the same kinds of things that relevance ranking has been based on since it was called automatic indexing in the late 1950s. So these are the kinds of things that, that go into ranking. And I'm, I'm dividing into two sections. One is what I call term ranking factors, which is ranking that has to do with the, your term and its appearance in the item. 
and then the other is item ranking factors. They're a little bit different. So term ranking factors go like this. Well, obviously one of the most important things is how often the term occurs in the item that is being ranked. So within item frequency. So a question is, well then, let's say I have a document, an HTML document where I have the word music and musician and musical and musically and music hyphen related and all those things and my query term is music. Do those four different variations on the word music count as the word music or are they each counted separately? So does the ranking take into a, is the ranking based on stemming? Are the words that are in the document stemmed before they are counted up for being frequent with respect to my query term? And the other question that's uh, usually, this is usually the norm in experimental research in working with information retrieval, but not necessarily the norm with search engines is um, if whether the frequency of the item in a document takes into account how long the document is. It's a little unfair to say that a 50-word uh, news squib is less important than a 5,000-word technical document because the word music occurs once in the news squib and 10 times in the technical document. It occurs that 10 times because it's 5,000 words as opposed to the little 50-word news squib. So good ranking algorithms normalize for document length. They say it isn't, we, we will discount or we will take into account the number of words in total in the document when you're calculating how frequently this word occurs in this document. That takes a lot of computing, takes a lot of work. Another important item is within file frequency. That is, um, if a search word occurs in every single article in, data, in a database or every single item in a database, it's not particularly good as a search term. It's not a particularly good discriminator. If you were to search psychological abstracts with the word psychological, you'd end up with half the database. If you were to search Eric with the word, the educational database with the word education, you'd end up with half the database. So the word education is not a particularly good search term. So its occurrence in items is kind of, well, it's almost in all the items. So is it really important? And a good weighting algorithm will take into account the frequency of a word across a whole collection. Well, that's not hard to do when your whole collection is several tens of thousands. It's not easy to do when your collection is a billion, 336 million, 990,000. And there are ways to kludge that and not do it with every single time the database is refreshed. But it's still an important thing to think about, not so much from a, I guess not so much from this point of view, but from a, a point of view of someone who's interested in how these things work, it's an interesting question to ask. Does your algorithm take into account the within file frequency of a word in making judgments about whether this document is more important to the user than this document in answer to the query? Another interesting thing is if you put two words in a different order and do the query again, you get a different answer, which would never happen in online searching. So the order of words in the query makes a difference in some search engines which is interesting. I presume the difference is that documents that have that exact same order would be ranked higher than documents which don't. So when you reverse the order, you reverse that, that ranking. And then the proximity of words to each other in the item is of course important. Things that are close together will be ranked more highly or if you have more than a one word query, if your two words or three words are close together, those documents will be ranked more highly than documents which uh, have them farther apart. Other term ranking factors may be the field. It may be that even in a database or a search engine where you can't search by field, where you cannot say I want this word in the title, it still may be the case that in the underlying ranking algorithm, if a word occurs in the title, it'll be given more importance in ranking decisions than if it does not occur in the title. Databases that search engines maintain, in many cases, include that positional information. When the, if you were to look from the computer point of view at the description of an individual website or web page, it would say not only what the word was that occurred in that item, but also what field it occurred in. And it probably says something about position as well, what position it occupies. That's the way you can make judgments about whether a word is within so many words of another word. So it might be that even though you can't search it, the fact that a word is in title might make, it rank, might make that item rank more highly, or in a heading, possibly in meta. Sometimes the fact, not that it's in a particular field, but just that the word is higher in the document gives that item higher rank. And so one of the things that the companies that run around and tell you how to get your uh, pages placed well will tell you is put your important words up at the top of your text, not in meta, but put them in, in your first paragraph right away because they might be paid more attention to. And then there's always money. You can pay a search engine, in some cases, uh, money to be associated with a keyword. So if somebody uses this word, your page will be sure to be ranked highly. That's not something we like to think about, but it certainly happens. Item ranking factors, as we know from Google and also from Direct Hit, 
some of the things that can make an item rank more highly have nothing to do, or beyond what, what have to do with its content, have to do with the fact that this item was particularly uh, liked by other people, so frequently selected by users, lingered on by users. Direct hit takes account of how long people spent looking at a page and give it an extra vote if people spent a long time at it. Or perhaps pointed to by many other items. A popular site which is pointed to by many other sites would rank more highly. And then there's preferred content, as I mentioned earlier. Partner content will rank more highly. Reviewed content, that is content which made it into the directory that the site provides, as well as the search engine part, will probably rank more highly. And of course, paid content will rank more highly. And then something that has word spamming will probably be ranked more lowly or thrown out of the database entirely in some cases. There's um, some penalizing for spamming. So where are we? That's kind of the state. That's where we are now. So what we have now is very big search engines with too much stuff in them, content too diverse, too much heterogeneous material, and it's only going to get worse. Where we also are is people don't ask queries very well, and the results aren't terribly reliable, and people aren't going to change. And search engines have to make a buck, which is getting harder and harder to do these days, and they need money. And I say these three things because I, I offer a few slides for each of these things just to point out where I think this, what the results of, of this state are. So I'll start with the money thing. I'll start at the bottom and get money out of the way. Search engines have a basic conflict. We want you to come and be happy, but if you're happy, you'll find where you want to go, and then you're going to go away. And if you go away, you're not going to look at our ads, and if you don't look at our ads, we're not going to get any money. So we want to make you happy, but we want you to stay. So how do we do that? Well, we can do it in a couple of ways. What Ask Jeeves does, which is one of the reasons I don't like Ask Jeeves, um, this is being, never mind. What, what Ask Jeeves does <laughs> is, so I do a search on, on Breton folk music, and I get, I get a list down here. I have folk, folkmusic.org down at the bottom here, uh, wherever it is. Anyway, folkmusic.org. And so I click on folkmusic.org, where normally I would then be taken to the site, or the site would then be brought to my computer. What happens is it's a subpage of Ask Jeeves. So I'm still looking at that ad. And I still count as an eyeball on that ad, so I still count as revenue. Now, to be fair, if I go on and click on anything that's in the folkmusic.org page, I'm going to be gone out of Ask Jeeves. But it's just a little extra time that I'm staring at something that is an ad. Um, you also have the uh, search engines that when you see the results, if you click on a result, it'll open up a new window. So that other window is still open and the ads are still being shown to you and you're still an eyeball on that ad. So they want you to stay. Now to be fair, I'd rather they did that kind of thing than charge me for searching. So The other thing they do is they want you to stay so they make it your personal portal. A lot of them have been doing this for some time. I set this up about three years ago to demonstrate it in class and it still recognizes me through four different computers. <laughs> Welcome, Candy, and I have my little what's the forecast for Bedford and Boston and Norwood underneath where you can't see because it wouldn't fit are the local TV listings for Cablevision of Boston now, whatever it's called, um, and so on. So you set up your own personal portal and you can arrange some things, but you can, there are certain parts you can't touch. Uh, you can't touch the content that X site is going to demand that you see. Some of it will be advertising, some of it will be the things they want you to go and see. But that's fine. It's a, a nice little service. You set up the things that you want. Um, and the idea is that I will now make this my home page whenever I log on. So when I say home, that's where I go. Well, not in your lifetime, but for a lot of people, <laughs> why not? Other things they can do to make you stay are give you a little tool that's going to make it more attractive for you to be there. So here is Lycos with their new thing called See More with Lycos. So Lycos See More analyzes the context of where you clicked and a pop-up window appears, which if you then click See More with Lycos will take you to the Lycos search engine and give you more information on whatever it was that was being highlighted. So what does that do? It gives Lycos a little more ad revenue and it gives you a nice extra quick service for getting to some searching on a topic you were interested in. And there's a bunch of things like that. Some of them bonded with search engines. Some of them bonded with the variety of different proprietary content. Other things search engine companies are doing is looking elsewhere for revenues. So what are they doing? They're selling themselves as search engines for enterprise portals, i.e. for intranets and for company-wide searching. Since the search engines have gone to a lot of trouble to try and work out searching, um, rather than somebody in a company trying to develop their own search engine, buy your AltaVista, buy your X site, buy your this, buy your that. So it's another market. So that's another thing that, that I think they're going to have to do. Or start charging. And I would ask myself, when I was doing this, I asked myself, would I be willing to pay for Google? 
And the answer is yes. I would probably be willing to pay a certain amount of dollars a year for the privilege of being able to get that kind of good service for certain kinds of searching. And I'd be willing to pay fast because I really like the fast search engine. Um, and there are probably four or five search engines that I'd be willing to pay. And it may come to that at some point, but I doubt it. Anyway, so that's the money part. Now, how about the it's only going to get bigger part? This is Google. Google, let's see, I actually have the figures written down somewhere. Uh, last year, not this past April, but April 2000 when I went to the search engine conference, everybody's mark was we want to be 800 million items big. We want our, the biggest database, it's 800 million items. Um, in April 2001, Google was claiming 1.3 billion items, but only 700 million were indexed for searching. The others are cached and you can retrieve them, but they're not what you're searching through in your search. By comparison, LexisNexis is more than double that size, and all of them are indexed. And Bright Planet says that the total web, Bright Planet is a company that looks into the deep web, Bright Planet says the total web is about 500 billion. So this is the total invisible web, or the deep web, and there's a little box of Google and a slightly bigger box of LexisNexis. And down at the bottom it says, these are conceptual, not calculated. So I didn't sit down with an actual diagram. I tried. It looked horrible in a bar chart, so I gave up. And the reason it looked horrible was the deep web was this big, and then the others were just lines on the bottom of the chart. So it didn't work. Um, and if you then went on and said, and all the information in the world, you would have a much bigger box within this within which this deep invisible web went. So it's only going to get bigger. It's not going to get any smaller. It may get better organized, but it's not going to get any smaller. The invisible web, um, in, in the way I look at it, divides itself up two ways. One is the invisible web that's invisible because it's inaccessible to discovery agents. And that includes, but not for all discovery agents. So some can cope and some can't. But that generally includes pages in, behind frames, Pages behind image maps, because a discovery agent can't click on an image map. Files that are in PDF until fairly recently. Pages generated by a CGI form, Cold Fusion, PHP, Java, and so on. Any site requiring a login, and anything behind robots.txt, more or less. And we heard a little bit about that um, earlier today. Um, so basically, it's anything that creates HTML on the fly, since the HTML doesn't really exist. And there's a lot more HTML on the fly than there used to be. And it's not because things are necessarily in databases being delivered HTML on the fly, which is our model for things like online public access catalogs and so on. It's because people are using better tools to create HTML. I recently heard someone who gave a Cold Fusion workshop say, I don't do HTML anymore. We don't create pages. We just put it all into Cold Fusion, and then we deliver it up as pages are composed. Well, that's really hard for an agent to deal with. So that's, that's the, uh, the invisible web part to me that is the part that it's hard for the agents to find. The other part is they don't bother. That's not the same as they can't. This is, it's not important to us. And so it's things that are, and this was based on a study um, that you probably know about by Giles, Steve Lawrence and, and I forget his name, Giles, um, who in 1994, Seven studied the invisible web and then again in 1999 and generally they found that search engines tended to focus on the dot com, avoid personal pages, not go very deep down in a lot of sites, avoid things that weren't in English, avoid things that weren't from the US and avoid things that weren't linked to by many other places. So if you studied that which was not, a, which was not in search engines even though it was publicly available, those are the kinds of things it tended to be. Now, a lot of that is not stuff you and I would want to see in a search engine. I'll grant you, not so much the English US part, but the personal pages. There are some very valuable personal pages, and there's a whole bunch of stuff you really don't want getting in the way when you're doing searches. The page is not in English, I would argue with. Certainly, being Canadian, I would argue with the pages from other than the US. And sometimes the unpopular pages or the shy pages are the ones that are really valuable. There's a lot of excellent material out there, and there's certainly some great material in the Un, un, unindexable or the undiscoverable invisible web. So this is good material, quality controlled material, regulated material, plus a whole bunch of garbage. And there's a lot of it out there. So is that is is the the bringing in of the invisible web or the deep web or the shy web or whatever you're going to call it changing at all? And I think it is. Um, AltaVista has been doing the last, I think, two weeks worth of Usenet newsgroups for years, almost since they started. So they've always been a little bit of Usenet. 
And I've been using Deja News since it first became available because it's one of the best places you can go and say things like, I've got the blue screen of death. Does anybody know what this is? Or why is Acrobat 4, and Ac why if I installed Acrobat 5 and I have Acrobat 4, is everything crashing? And, and Usenet is a great place to answer those kinds of questions. So I was very distressed when I went to, to Deja News a couple of months ago and found out that Google had, had gobbled them, so to speak. Um, but Google now has Google Groups, which is takeover of Deja News. Now, they don't blend it with the search results. It's a separate search, unlike AltaVista, which blends the Usenet and HTML stuff together, which is kind of interesting. But that's an example of how non-HTML content's on the increase. Uh, Lycos has an advanced FTP search. It calls it free downloads, but file transfer protocol, basically, anonymous FTP, as we used to know it, is getting free downloads. And so you can do quite a sophisticated FTP search for FTP files. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we're able to access. Lycos and, and many other search engines, and for some time, have been providing access to multimedia. I use this when I'm searching for images to support lectures. And I used to teach records management. I'd come here and do filing cabinets and find wonderful pictures of filing cabinets. Very handy. Um, these days, if you do it, you have to go through a whole big screen worth of, yes, if I look at anything pornographic, I won't blame you. I'm sorry. I accept. Let's go on and look at the pictures of the filing cabinets, please. Um, but, and I understand why that's necessary. But anyway, there's certainly more non-HTML content than there used to be. And then Google is now doing PDF files, which opens up a whole range of high-quality research material, as well as a whole bunch of commercial other kinds of things. But then Google's now doing PDF. And if Google does it, who's going to be far behind? And then AltaVista, although it keeps it separate as far as I know from the general search, is bringing you the New York Times in their news section, powered by Moreover. And Moreover is a company that's been trying to blend syndicated and intranet resources for a while and has arrangements with things like the New York Times. So the, the whole bunch of stuff that's out there for search is becoming less homogenous, even though it wasn't homogenous to begin with. I mean, it's not homogenous in even between HTML documents. Now you've got all this other stuff going on as well. So do we really want to know about all that stuff? And the answer probably is yes. And the company that hopes to tell you all about it is Bright Planet, or Bright Planet, also known as Complete Planet. And their website's known as Complete Planet. But the company is known as Bright Planet. And Bright Planet is um, trying to uncover the deep web, as they say. They've developed something called Lexbot, which they hope will go through, and they've been using it actually, will go through um, sites which are sites which must be searched in order to retrieve information, and Lexbot will go and do that searching and get that information and bring it back and make it indexable and make it searchable. Right now they are a directory with access to many thousands of databases and search engines. Um, with information that, you, that is stored about the different databases and search engines so that you can search for search engines or databases in particular subject fields, which is kind of nice. But to my knowledge, yet you can't search through those different databases. You still are led to choose one to search, although that I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if that would change pretty quickly. So Bright Planet is interested in bringing the deep web to us. So what are we going to do to avoid the avalanche? Because it's bad enough with its 1 billion, and now we're going to be looking at 500 billion items available for search. So I have a couple of avoiding the avalanche. That's the 10 minute left mark. Sorry. A couple of avoiding the avalanche suggestions. These are the things that I do. I, I use, I don't actually use Yahoo very much, um, except foreign Yahoos. But I use Look Smart mostly. I use the open directory. But I'll use that kind of tool when I know that there's going to be a section. And I just want a couple of good pages. Like I want to go to some collections of JavaScript. So I'm going to go through these kinds of things. I'm not going to go into Google and search JavaScript. Sure, I'll get some stuff. But I'm also going to have to look through a lot of stuff I don't want. So I, I think one way to avoid the avalanche is go to these, these things, which are going to be smaller. They're going to be care selected, I would say, carefully. But I'm not sure that's true. But selected, anyway, by human beings and organized into some taxonomy that I can understand. So that's one way. Another way of avoiding the avalanche is to take, make use of the power tools to um, be sure that the search you're doing is restricted by characteristics that are appropriate. So this is um, Northern Lights power search screen. And in addition to just from the basic type lines, being able to restrict a title, restrict a publication name, restrict to words in the URL, 
I think much more interestingly, you can limit to subject based on their combination of automatic and intellectual classification scheme, and you can limit documents to particular types, and you can do it by language, and do it by country, and you can do a date range, and you can sort by different features as well, although it doesn't show it here. So if you're doing the kind of search where that's useful, then somebody provides the capability for you doing that. So where that's, tr where that's available, I would take advantage of that. Other ways to avoid the avalanche are go to the um, gateways, the subject gateways or the specialized collections. So Adam is a subject gateway that's been around for a while in art design, architecture, and media. Um, this is part of a, a whole UK uh, funded um, project to try and develop good quality subject gateways in disciplinary areas. And the gateways really are indexed and cataloged and put in a database collections of descriptions of internet resources, very carefully um, taken care of, much like a library catalog. And those are very useful for a certain type of information, for the kind of information you'd want in a, an academic sense. Uh, otherwise, I go to Complete Planet and I'd look around through their Yahoo-like organization. I just picked um, law and politics just to pick something that was familiar to you. So here's a little list of the subcategories with, and presumably each of these has at least one if not more than one specialized search engine listed and described at the Complete Planet site on that topic. And any of the directories are going to give you that kind of stuff. So looking for smaller collections is going to avoid looking through 500 billion things. Other things that are happening is, why should you have to run around and try and find the smaller collection? Why shouldn't you be able to do a search which, which then finds the right collection for you? And the answer is, well, you should, and someday it will happen. This has actually been an idea in a lot of people's minds for a lot of years, but um, this is distributing search, and it works like this. These are the specialized databases down here at the bottom. If I can, yeah, these down here at the bottom are the specialized databases, so in different fields or different collections or whatever. Each of them forms for itself some form of automatic meta information which characterizes the content in some way so that when you do a search through the search distribution capability, what it does is figure out, figures out which search engine is going to be best. This is not like meta searching, which is raw, let's search and merge and give you results. This is, so which of these 10,000, 500,000, 50,000 databases out there is going to be useful for this query? based on their own meta information, then let's connect you with that one or do your search in that one or some combination of that one. It's a lot of work. There are a lot of questions about how this is going to work, but there are a lot of people who are interested in doing this, a lot of companies who are interested in doing this. So that might be something we'll see to control the avalanche. Well, the other things search engines have to cope with are, what do people do when they type in that little query bar? Well, sometimes they type URLs. You would think it's because they want to find something on that URL. No, it's actually in many cases because that's where they think you type the URL to go there. <laughs> it's true. You ask AOL or you ask any of the search engines and they'll say people actually think that that's where you type the URL. So you see that kind of thing. And then you see truck accessories misspelled, a lot of misspellings. People are getting a little bit better about how many words they use. The figure three years ago at the search engines conference was 1.2, and now it's 2 point something or something like that. And everybody calls this the Ask Jeeves effect. If you have to ask questions, it takes more words. Therefore, when you go to other search engines, you use more words. That's kind of cool. But anyway, they have to deal with this, these basically not very good, or what we call well, poorly formed or ill-formed queries. So what do they do? Well, a lot of search engines are working on improving the ranking methods. This is a government-funded uh, annual conference where people who do ranking for a living from a research point of view and also from a search engine point of view come together and they compare, they play mine is better than yours <laughs> against a big set of collections. And so everybody learns from it. So it goes some way to improving ranking. Everybody learns a little bit, they take home and they tweak their own ranking algorithm and make it a little bit better. Another thing you can do is leverage the user's knowledge. This is Oingo. There's actually a couple of um, quasi-semantic processors like this. So in Oingo, I typed bridge and hit submit. And Oingo came back and said, OK, well, you know, bridge is pretty ambiguous. Did you mean construction, game, electric circuit, denture, connection, body part, construction supplies, village in the UK, upper deck support? And I'll give you some results, but they'll be better if you can tell me what you actually mean. And I will probably see more of that. Other things that search engines can do is if they're going to give you a lot of stuff, at least organize it a little bit better so you can get right to what you want quickly. So we all know Northern Light has its little folders based on that combination of intellectual and automatic classification. 
So in Northern Light, I do a search on XML applications and libraries, and it gives me what it thinks are the best results, but then also divides things up into little folders that I can explore further. That's fine. This is cool. This is iLor, which is a new uh, little thing on top of Google where you go to iLor and you, you type your search in. It runs the search through Google. And then as you're mousing down the results, this little window opens up that says, put it in my list, go now, but anchor here so I can come back. Open in taskbar, open in new window. So if I did this one and said, put it in my list, I get this little window that sits over by the side that keeps a running list of the things I'm interested in. Then I can go back and look through those. Little added value, nice little touch. You can download it and have it be a taskbar on your machine, but you don't have to. I did this live on the web without downloading it. Now we're getting into the more researchy. Organize results visually. This is Visit, which I uh, downloaded in a beta from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. You do your search. It runs it through a bunch of search engines. Uh, you can change which ones, and I don't even know which ones, and I don't really care. Um, it, it, uh, so I did, again, XML applications and libraries. It brings you back the top important sites, shows you how many pages were at that site on that topic, makes the red the ones that are most likely to be best, and shows you the interconnections. So gee, a lot of the other sites point to this. So this is probably a really important document. And if I mouse over any of these things, it'll then open up a little description of what that particular page is going to say before I go there. This is just beginning, but I think there's going to be a lot of work in visualization, and this is one example of visualization. And you didn't have to sign, I mean, you have to sign up, but you didn't have to be anybody special to beta test this. I did it yesterday, so it's really easy. Another one, MapNet, you've probably all been reading about this kind of stuff. I think there was a piece in the Globe on MapNet and a couple of related things. So here's the world up here, uh, up there, and I click on sports and I get a little sub-map of sports, so it tries to take search results or a bunch of stuff, kind of like a Yahoo bunch of stuff, and put it in a visual way. And while that works for geography, I'm not sure I understand <laughs> why computers is next to art and not next to sports. What does it mean that basketball is at the top of this and softball is the bottom? There's no real inherent semantic anything going on here. It is simply making it easier for you to absorb a bunch of stuff in one visual. And they chose map. Other people choose room, floor plan. Further on, this is, this is sort of looking beyond now. Where are we going to see in the farther future? Well, I hope you've all, if you haven't, you should go and see Screen Fridge. I came across this two years ago. This is search from your screen front, your fridge front. You can do your email, you can do your searching, you can do food management. It will tell you what you have in the fridge and what you can make with it. And then you can leave messages for your family on front of the fridge and stuff like that. So. While, while this is, it's serious and it's Electrolux, how many people are actually going to buy this? I'm sure some are. But that's kind of, of out there. The paper computer is not. I've, um, Asus, the local chapter of Asus ran a little session on paper computers a couple of years ago. Whoops, don't put your hand around your throat. A couple of years ago. And this is a paper computer. It's a little website in the catalog. You get the piece of paper and it's a little computer. You can order stuff from the catalog and then you can throw it away. The disposable. And then this is what I really lust after. Yes, I like this classroom, but personally I lust after wearables. I want wearable computers. And so this is just the ubiquitous. I mean, we're not gonna, it's everywhere, and it's going to continue to be everywhere. So if it's everywhere, what does that mean for search? And the answer is search is going to be embedded into the devices that you use to access the Internet. So although I couldn't actually draw you a good cell phone, this is another example of a visualization tool. This is Lasso where you can hone in on a particular city and then choose a topic over here. It'll show you what there is in that area, within your, what's in, within your area that falls into those topics, and then gives you a little list of them over here. And of course, I presume it's paid content, and so you're not seeing every single museum in, or art gallery in Boston. But this kind of thing is going to be in your car, and it's going to be in your cell phone. And there was an article in the Globe last week about somebody who's um, trying to do this so you can step out of the subway and you can see exactly what stores there are around you on a physical map, well why not on this kind of a map? Further on than that, and this is something that people talk about at the search engines conferences, is why should it all be different places we have to go? Why can't we all do it from one place and it should all be really one search from our point of view? So I think the time will come when you will do a search and you will probably get to prioritize what it's done through, but it can be done through with the same blow, your desktop information, your intranet, 
commercial databases, this is library and information science abstracts, the public web or that part of it that you think is appropriate, and here's my Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates, my HMO, your personal service providers. So that will happen at some point, sort of portalization in a way, or different layers of portals, and search through those different layers. This was actually, I, I, we, we this is supposed to say, you know, it's like we do library instruction in schools, we're going to do search instruction in schools, and there actually were two papers at the last search engines conference, one from Japan and one from the US, where um, funded money was gotten to have large databases in elementary schools and teach students about searching properly, not just here's Google, play with it, but really good searching. So this is my, did everybody do their searching homework? So I think that will happen. This is what I, I hate to think will happen and probably will. This is my last slide. I actually found this on the web uh, this morning. I've been looking for it for a while. This is a, an implant. It actually, it's, it's bigger than it should be. It's very small, but it is an implant. It's a brain implant. It's a microchip brain, brain implant. And so I pretended that we're in the future and this guy is sitting in this market and the computer says, if you're going to buy those beans to make rice and beans, the fridge says you're out of rice. Oh, and there's a sale on the gap behind you. They have that red t-shirt that's almost in rags according to the closet. You're going to eat lunch now. You're going to eat lunch now. There's a good Thai place across the street. It has the same dish that you eat at the restaurant in Watertown. By the way, I booked your flight and hotel for next week. Want to see what the view from the room is like. And watch out for that car. BPS. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, let me show you, um, I'll take questions too, but let me show you one thing that, um, just so you can go back for further reference, I think this is my favorite mouse, close. Okay, this is my, my web page, website, um, it's at web.sentence.edu slash what I call tilde, what if you're younger you call squiggle schwartz, <laughs> so tilde schwartz, and I've got a topic directory section, in the topic directory section, I have a search engines component, and the search engines part uh, breaks it down into the about, which is what I wanted to point out. This is where you find the things about search engines, but there's also a page on agents and browsers and directories and meta search and query engines and a tips page. But on the about page, you will find, if I can make it work, um, web search, that's the thing I referred to you earlier, referred you to earlier, which is very good for finding out about search engines. Also, um, Search Engine Watch, which is the best site on search engines as for my money. Um, search Engine Showdown by Greg Nodes, which is also a wonderful site. And then if you really want to see what people are talking about at the Search Engines Conference, they actually have all the PowerPoint presentations up from the last four years. Um, everybody's. And this includes people like big names in search engine land. And there's a whole bunch of more newsletters and portals for search engines and so on. So if you want to find out a lot more, these are, I think, good places to go. And there's a few little readings down at the bottom, including the Lawrence and Giles on the Invisible Web. Okay, technically we're out of time, but I'm, you know, free to answer questions. If anybody has any questions, ask. Or not. Whatever. Questions? All right. Yes? Is this PowerPoint show on your page? Apparently, it's part of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah Callie's going to store them. This is my very first ever webcast. <laughs> and I don't know if the webcasts are actually going to be stored. Is the, are the actual videos of the? Yeah. Oh, cool. Very cool. I have to tell my dean. So yes, it'll be available from Callie. That's what I'm counting on. And if you ever have any trouble, just ask, email me and I'll send it. It's no problem. Okay, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Have a good rest of conference. I have to go do my email. <laughs>